Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a Valentine's Day edition of Science Pub. My name is Nathan Moses, Associate Director of Events and Engagement at OSU Cascades, and it's great to have you all with us here tonight. This evening, we're privileged to hear from Cole Serrato, representing the College of Agricultural Sciences, as he gives his talk entitled, Clearing the Haze Around Wildfire Smoke's Impact on Wine. Now, with this topic being about wine and it being about February 14th, whether you're with a loved one, family, or flying solo tonight, providing, of course, you're over the age of 21, we invite you to bring out your favorite bottle of wine for tonight's Science Pub. Why? Well, I'm glad you asked that. About halfway through tonight's presentation, Cole is going to invite you to participate in a bit of scholarly wine tasting. So whether you're a seasoned connoisseur or a neophyte in the realm of wine appreciation, we invite you to join us for this fun and educational experience. Before we get to our program tonight, let's give you a quick reminder about our audience participation process. Like all science pubs, from the audience, uh, hearing from the audience is one of the most rewarding parts of the show. We want to hear from you, so participants for tonight's science pub may submit questions for our presenter via the YouTube live chats if you're logged in there, or via Mintimeter app found at www.minty.com. Tonight's event code is going to be 5118 if your question is not answered, feel free to submit it to events at osucascades.edu. For convenience, you will also find the QR code here on the screen now and at the bottom of your screens throughout the presentation. Feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation and we'll get as many answered as we can after the presentation. All right, so let's get right into the introduction of tonight's guest of honor, Dr. Cole Serrato. Uh, grew up on the East Coast in a very small town near Juniper, uh, Jupiter, I said Juniper, Jupiter, Florida. He graduated from the University of South Florida in Tampa with a bachelor's degree and a PhD in chemistry, where he worked on a project that could help slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease with a chemical compound found in beets. Sounds like another science pub topic we need to <laughs> take a look at. After grad school, Cole made the drive to Oregon when he was hired as a post doctoral scholar in Dr. Elizabeth Tomasino's research group at Oregon State University to investigate the chemical causes of smoke taint in Oregon wines, which is what he's going to present on this evening. We very much thank Cole for his time tonight. And again, making sure everyone of legal consumption age has your favorite bottle of wine ready to go. And Cole, the screen is yours, my friend. And to all our viewers, welcome again to Science Pub. Excellent. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, give me just one second, audience, while I do all the technical parts of sharing my screen and getting the presentation ready. Okay, and again, thank you for having me tonight. So tonight, what I'm gonna be talking about predominantly is gonna be a lot of the research that I've been performing in Dr. Elizabeth Tomasino's lab in the Department of Food Science and Technology at Oregon State University, where what we are looking at are some of the chemical causes of uh, what is occurring in wine grapes and wine during wildfire events. And we're trying to find some of these chemical causes so that potentially we might be able to help ameliorate or mitigate some of these causes in the future. But before we can do that, we need to talk a little bit about what some of those chemical causes might be. So in this talk, I want to present a lot about the uh, impact, why this is so important, not only for us in the Oregon Valley, but a lot of the West Coast, Australia, the world even at this point. I want to talk a little bit about a background of uh, wine chemistry itself. So I understand that a lot of people may not be chemists. You probably aren't chemists, and I want to ensure that everybody is engaged in this topic that I think is incredibly in interesting and has a lot of applications outside of what we're talking about tonight. And then I'm going to go into some of the research now that you have some background. And in between that, we're going to do a little bit of wine tasting once we've learned about some of that background chemistry. So with that being said, let's talk a little bit about the smoke chemistry itself and how do we taste it. And so you guys probably won't have the opportunity to ever taste smoked wine because they typically, most uh, retailers aren't going to sell this. You're not going to want it out there because the flavor can sometimes be a little uh, aggressive. It is not something that is necessarily that people want to uh, taste. And when we talk about smoke and wine, typically it's going to revolve around flavor, to some extent taste and mouthfeel, but predominantly flavor in this case. And when you taste this smoke, if you ever have the opportunity, and if we have any winemakers, uh, especially those from 2020 uh, here on the West Coast in the audience tonight, you'd probably have tasted some of these smoke sensory characteristics. The first one being ashy. This is just kind of straight up tasting ash. It is a very 
uh, aggressive and kind of gross flavor to me. Uh, a medicinal flavor that can sometimes be in kind of cough syrupy, sometimes band-aid-y. Uh, there is this kind of effect that we'll talk about later where the type of smoke that you get can sometimes influence the flavor and the different types of chemicals or the different types of sensory characteristics they'll have. The one that I am typically the most sensitive to is this kind of campfire smell or campfire flavor where it kind of tastes a little bit like a campfire that's just been sitting outside overnight. It is very unpleasant. I'm not a huge fan of tasting this when we have to do our own smoked wines. It, it lingers. Um, uh, and then obviously you'll taste some that are a little bit burnt. Some, some of them have that kind of like rubbery, almost like a burnt hair sort of uh, smell or flavor to them. Some people are fortunate and that they may not taste this. About one in six, according to one study, is not able to taste some of this. And this is something in our own research when we're doing some of the sensory uh, sensory studies with uh, master student Jenna and Dr. Tomasino. Um, they need to kind of keep this in mind that some people may not be able to taste this. And this is something for winemakers to be aware of as well, is that they need to understand their sensitivities and that they may not be able to sense this uh, as well as others. And so for those of us who were here in Oregon, Willamette Valley in 2020, it's probably very vivid to you still, but for anybody in the audience that may not have been here during that time, much of the West Coast was absolutely covered in smoke during September 2020. And at this point in time, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about the maturity of grapes. At this point in time, the grapes uh, for Pinot Noir at least are very mature. Same thing with the Chardonnay that we were growing uh, up here in Monroe, Oregon, they were very mature at this point. And this is where the smoke is starting to adhere to some of these grapes. And it's during this period that is very crucial that we start learning how to mitigate this. And so if we look at some of those topographical maps, even from that time, looking at smoke density, we can see that this is not just a coastal thing. This is not just West Coast. We're seeing the smoke as the wind had changed from that West Coast direction into that East Coast direction that some of the smoke was traveling all the way over to Maine. And while this may not affect the wine that is over in New York, because uh, studies like uh, Tom Collins is doing up in Washington, uh, is finding that some of this, quote, old smoke, or the smoke that's basically dissipated over time, isn't having as much of an effect. There is still that uh, the tendency for air quality to be something that we do need to be concerned about more than sometimes the, the wine itself. And so during that time, during September 2020, Portland and basically all of Lambent Valley, I've circled here in the green, had some of the absolute worst qual air quality in the world at that time. And we sustained that for a few days straight, if I recall correctly. And again, this is more so for that audience who was not here in the valley during that time, because for me, that was very ingrained. This was everywhere. It was pervasive. We were uh, surrounded by fires on all sides, but there were four coming from the east, heading towards the west, and they were moving very quickly overnight. There were some that were even occurring and sending smoke that were on the coast and blowing in once the wind had changed. And so it was very aggressive and it occurred, it felt like overnight, I think it was around Memorial Day. And so this is something that here in the Valley, there are many, 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 many different wineries that are up and down uh, Lambert Valley in Oregon. And it affected many of, these, uh, many of these wineries. And it tends to be that the ones that are closest to some of these fires tend to be the most affected because some of them seem to be spared. And we will see some, and have seen some really great wines that have come out of 2020 already. Uh, but some wines you probably might not be able to see on the shelves because the smoke impacted some of the varietals that we typically would have seen in a regular non-smoky year. And so just kind of one last, like for those who weren't here, I just wanted to show like how dramatic it was uh, during that time. It, for me, coming from the East Coast, moving to the West Coast, I, you can give me a hurricane over those fires any day of the week because it feels very apocalyptic during that time. This is that moment when living your research is not very fun. And so you could see that the sun was bright orange during the day. You couldn't see two blocks down the road uh, at Oregon State University. And this uh, picture I have on the right here, this is making the rounds on the internet during the time, this was in Salem, uh, someone had posted this. And this is in the evening as the sun is kind of catching some of those chemicals at a certain angle and it kind of traps a lot of those red uh, light coming out. So it looks very apocalyptic. Um, but this is not just a West Coast thing. This is not just an Oregon thing. This, uh, I don't know how many people remember 2020 outside of COVID, but COVID did not start 2020. In fact, it was the Australian wildfires that were carrying over from December uh, 2019 into 2020 
It was one of the biggest news stories out there at the time. And so in these two, two diagrams that I have uh, here, I'm showing the wildfires on the right and where they had occurred during 2020. And if we look at those wildfires, where they're occurring in relationship to the location of many of the wineries, the most popular wineries that are in Australia, we're seeing a lot of co-occurrence there. And Australia is another one of those countries that is very concerned about wildfires and the quality of the wine that they're producing. And they have their own facilities uh, and their own teams that are doing some of this research as well. And we often work in tandem with them so that we can attack this from as many points of view as possible so that we can ensure that the quality of wine going out is as good as possible and that these, these wineries and these grape growers are able to maintain them, their, their businesses for as long as possible. We don't want to see any of these, these people going out of business. But this is, you know, when we, when we talk about wine and wildfires and smoke, we tend to relegate this towards West Coast United States, mostly towards uh, Australia. But here in 2021, we're seeing these effects spreading across the world, especially in regions that tend to be a little bit drier, where we are often growing some high quality wines as well. And so there were some uh, European wildfires that were affecting some of the wineries, such as the one close to Saint-Tropez in France. And we even saw several uh, around Italy and even to some extent Greece as well, where a lot of these fires could be potentially affecting some of these wineries that are national worldwide um, as well. And so in a national trend, this was this study was performed and aggregated by the National Intra Interagency Fire Center. Encouragingly, we are seeing that the general trend for the number of fires you can see in the blue we can see that it is generally decreasing. And this is telling us that we as a nation and the programs that we have are getting better at preventing wildfires. What is occurring though, if we look at the green bars is that the general trend is that the area burned is increasing. And so this gives us some ideas that despite being better at being able to prevent some of these wildfires, the, the amount of land that is being burned is still increasing. And this is where we start talking about implications around climate change and ways that we can have an impact. Um, and there are many, many discussions about this that I'm not gonna go too much into about the reasons why wildfires uh, size is increasing, but that the data shows that they are increasing um, when we look at an overall trend. And this is something that we need to be concerned about as we go forward in the future and have some sort of steps for wineries in the future to take care of this. So I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit at this point, and we're gonna start talking a little bit about wine chemistry. I don't, I'm not gonna dump the smoke chemistry on you quite yet. I'm gonna move into some of the fun stuff first so that when we start talking about the smoke chemistry, it feels a little more natural and we can kind of ease into it just a little bit. But the chemistry of wine, it is both very simple and somewhat complicated. And the simple part of it is, is predominantly, wine chemistry is predominantly water. The next portion of it is gonna be the ethanol. And this can sometimes vary depending on the wine that you get, 13, as high as 15% on the very, very high side. And then there's this 3%. And in this graphic that I had pulled from um, an online magazine, they call it the 3% that brings the magic. But as a chemist, I don't necessarily believe in magic. And I kind of don't want to use that word sometimes because it kind of implies that there is something unexplainable here. And I think what's even more interesting is that when we do explain it, it is even more interesting to talk about. And so the magic that we're actually talking about here is a series of chemicals. And so when we talk about the magic of wine, it could be different acids. And I list here, there is no way that I can list every single chemical over the course of a short talk. This would be a course or two, a few books that you'd have to read. Uh, but these are some of the main chemicals that you'll often hear about. You can kind of talk about this with people, whether it's tartaric acid, and so when we're looking at chemical structures here, I like to use these kind of stick structures because they're very clean, they're easy to look at. And for those of you who did not take a chemistry course, uh, every point here is a carbon atom with an appropriate number of hydrogen atoms or protons attached to it uh, in order to fill the octet rule for the, uh, for the molecule or for that atom in particular. So the first one that you see is tartaric acid is a type of acid that is produced in grapes Another one that you might hear of is also called malic acid or lactic acid, and those are involved in other types of winemaking strategies, something to keep track of uh, to produce some other chemicals that might produce uh, different types of sensory, uh, sensory events that can occur in the mouth. 
the ones that people most often associate with wine, we're maybe not talking about acids, we're talking about, say, tannins. You can see in this region here, tannins. This is a catechin monomer of a tannin. There are many types of catechins, and they often do not occur completely in these. So a monomer is basically one chemical linkage, whereas um, typically they're going to evolve and bind into larger and larger molecules, becoming polymers, polymers. And so they'll link up, and as they link up, the chemical structure and the electrons just tend to get denser and denser. And this is where we start getting into talking about mouthfeel and color to some extent. And we can see down here when we start talking about anthocyanins. Anthocyanins are some of my favorite chemicals that I'm going to talk about here when we talk about um, the maturity of grapes. And these, these, these anthocyanins, especially in Pinot Noir for the Oregonians, that are often giving off some of the color that we associate with these purple, these nice purple Pinot Noirs. I'm going to show a really cool graphic later that kind of explains why it does this. And then finally, some of the other chemicals are some of these, um, we'll call them phenols right now. So when I say phenols, it means it has this phenyl ring with an alcohol on the end, and they kind of combine this into a portmanteau of phenol. And so it's these chemicals, these very simple chemicals that are produced naturally in wine. But the problematic part about it is that nature and plants, there's a lot of overlap in their chemistry. And that's just based on how they evolved and the pressures that were on them as they were evolving is that there is this kind of overlap that occurs. And so these last three chemicals I wanted to list, they're not probably something that would be on your radar if you're ever talking about wine chemistry, but there's something that I think need to be mentioned right now because they can be in the background oftentimes in a lot of wines. We can measure them at some sort of base level. Most times you don't even know. Uh, but it's these chemicals that are also coming in from the smoke as well. And that's something I just wanted to highlight these at the moment because they're going to come back because this is what's going to complicate the matter and why this research is so important is because this, uh, this research can get kind of complicated because there is this, this overlap between these two, these two types of chemicals. So where do you find these chemicals? This is a very complicated graphic. I'm not going to sit here and list off every single thing, but I just wanted to show that there is some sort of compartmentalization where these chemicals are produced. There is some sort of biology to it. And so you'll often be able to associate the skins with a certain amount of the tannins or other types of the, the, uh, the flavanols that I pointed out in the last slide. We can also look at some of those anthocyanins as well. In the, uh, in the middle of the berry, you're going to see other types of the chemicals, as well as in the seeds, you'll often get even more tannins. They kind of really dry out the mouthfeel. And so when wine uh, winemakers are examining the berries for ripeness, they're often going through each of these different parts and tasting them almost individually as they pop them in their mouth or walking through the vineyard. Uh, it's a very fun thing to do. If you ever get a chance to do it, I recommend it. They'll walk through the wine or walk through the vineyard, pop one of the berries, they'll eat the juice of the berry, separate the skin, separate the seed, taste the juice, pull out the chemicals from that, taste it. They'll chew a little bit on the uh, on the skin, kind of extract some of the chemicals because that's where a lot of those tannins are going to come from and other flavor profiles. Uh, and then finally, if they're so inclined, they can even use the seeds to some extent, but the seeds are full of those, uh, those tannins and they, they often really dry out your mouth. And so uh, it's often really fun to just bite on one and just have that kind of like puckered feel for a second as we go through and taste these. It's, it's very interesting. And so when we talk about grape maturation, the berry is not the same the whole time. For grape maturation, we're not just talking about a color change. We're talking about a whole hormonal shift as we go from the, the small berry, the flowering, into this small berry size here. And in this one, we're going to have a lot of that tartrate, that tartaric acid is going to be in high concentrations. And over time, what it's doing is it's building a lot of this berry size, and it's starting to build a lot of these acids up that over time, the berry is going to get bigger and bigger, and a lot of these chemicals are going to shift from tartrate producing more tannins, hydroxycinamates, some of these methoxypyrazines that we often associate with like this green flavor or bell pepper. And then eventually we're going to go through a process called veraison. And veraison is very obvious in red wines because we often see this kind of mixture in berries. You've got about 50% in this purple phase and about 50% in this green phase. Uh, for green, green grapes, white wines, 
it is a little bit more subtle, but you can often tell with a little bit of practice. It starts out as this very intense green and it kind of like yellows out, just kind of dulls that green just a little bit. And so what's occurring at this point is that the flavor is starting to soften. It's not quite as sour. It's not quite as bitter. You're starting to get some of these uh, sugars that are increasing, the glucose, the fructose, the anthocyanins, a lot of these flavor compounds. And so this is why it's so important for a lot of these, uh, these winemakers to understand the growth process of their grapes and the weather outside, whether it is smoky or if it's just sunny, this can have an impact on the flavor of the overall grapes. So this is something that they'll often be very concerned about. And so one thing that I wanted to point out, this is mostly because in grad school, I did a lot of work around color. And I think color is absolutely fascinating from the chemical point of view. And so when I had an opportunity to do this, I wanted to be able to show everybody what this is about. And so what you see is the, the intensity of the color as it goes through Verazon is going to go from this green color. And so these are Pinot Noir grapes, uh, if I recall correctly going from a small berry up to a much larger berry. And we can see that the color is changing from that green to the purple. And so what's happening is it's undergoing these chemical changes over time, either enzymatically or through um, equilibrium. And it's gonna go from this pelargonidin through cyanidin all the way up to this chemical called malvidin. And you know, just the chemistry, the chemistry geek in me gets really excited because I'm like, oh, this is really cool because it's malvidin, malvidin 3 glucoside typically, uh, which is not just a single color. This one molecule isn't purple. It is actually two colors, and that's what's so interesting about it. It's not unique by any means, but to me it's really interesting because it's showing both red and blue. And so when you get red and blue for Pinot Noir, this is where we get that nice, rich purple color is from this malvidin 3 glucoside that we see here. And to me, that's, that's just really cool. It's really interesting to see where some of these physical effects that we have right in front of our eyes are coming from, from a microscopic point of view that we could never see with our eyes. And so one of the fun things to talk about when we're talking about the flavor of wine is the chemistry, I think. And so when people talk about what they're tasting. And if you ever take a wine class, it's always really interesting because people are talking about tasting all sorts of different things. They're tasting stone fruits. They're tasting uh, red fruits. They're tasting, you know, banana or green apple or honey, or maybe it's grassy or bell pepper or anything like that. You have a whole list on this slide that can describe different ways, different ways that people smell the wines or taste the wine. And Nobody in, in the classroom or nobody in the setting is wrong here. And that's what's so cool about it, because what you're tasting is what you're tasting. You have that association. And what's also more fascinating about this, too, is that the chemistry of it often agrees with that person as well. And so if something tastes a little bit like, it tastes like bananas, well, that's because it probably produced some amount of isoamyl acetate, as you can see in the slide here. Um, Sometimes you get these, this kind of green, grassy, it would be potentially these pyrazines that are uh, involved. We talked a little bit about, um, we didn't talk a little bit about it, but like rose and some of these floral scents, you can get some of these terpenes. And so that's what's absolutely cool about this is wines can be so complex and they're so interesting. And there's so many different chemicals that we can use to discuss it and evaluate it and research it that it just becomes a unique experience from wine to wine to wine to person to person to person. And so at this point, if you've got your glass of wine nearby, go ahead and grab that. Um, and so what I have tonight is I actually had to come to Florida uh, for a family emergency. And so I had to go to the store and like, I really wanted to get some Oregon Pinot Noir because I have to represent the Valley at this point, especially being uh, working at Oregon State. So I actually found a couple of bottles of Oregon Pinot Noir. So what I'm gonna have tonight is something called, I don't know if you can see it in the light, Yamhill Valley Pinot Noir. Uh, their selection, because it is Florida, was very slim. I gave my family the Lamette Valley State Pinot Noir so that they could actually try, try that one. Uh, so this is gonna be my first time drinking this one. And so I just wanted to give everybody the opportunity to have that kind of side pub feel at the moment. So as you can see, I have my Pinot Noir poured in my glass. I poured it a little bit earlier just so I could allow some of the, some wines that can, they can have a high content of ethanol and the ethanol is very volatile. And I wanted some of that to kind of burn off so that I could actually smell what's underneath it. And so 
some people, you can look at it, have a neutral background if you can. You can sometimes see with certain wines that that nice purple color is in there, or if it's a Chardonnay, you can get that kind of like buttery color or a whiter color. Um, some wines purposely, they sometimes have a sediment to them, um, and that's perfectly normal for some wines as well. Sometimes it has to do with the age of the wine. Uh, next thing you'd want to do, this is kind of what you would do as like a doctor as well. You look, listen, and then you, you act. Uh, in this case, instead of listening, it's going to be smell. And so smell, you can swirl it just a little bit. And it, what this is doing is it's kind of swirling up a lot of those chemicals, allowing them to reach some sort of equilibrium. So you're not just getting the first thing that you smell and only smelling that, you're getting a nice mixture. And it kind of burns off some of that ethanol again so that you're not just getting burned nose. And when you want to take a smell, you stick your nose in there. And this is what a lot of people do, myself included, when I first started drinking wine a couple of years ago when I started this position, just take a big old breath. You don't want to do that. When you smell wine, you don't want to oversaturate your the sensors in your um, in your nasal nasal passage. You want to take a normal breath. You stick up to your nose. Just take a gentle breath, and then you kind of absorb that. You can even start to think about what you are smelling at this point. Whether you're getting some of those dark notes, Pinot Noir. I always get like these very heavy. Uh, red fruits coming out of it, dark fruits like plums or things like that. And then finally, you can taste it. And at this point, that's when it's completely up to you. And so I'm not going to do the full tasting at this point because you'll see some of the uh, the wine drinkers, winemakers and stuff like that in order to best get the quality out of the wine. Sometimes you'll hear like a slurping noise, kind of like they do with uh, coffee, but not quite as aggressive as you'll hear it with coffee. I'm not going to do that on this microphone, but you can do that yourself and kind of see how that experience changes as you're aerating some of the wine in your mouth. So what that's doing is it's kind of volatilizing some of those chemicals so that it goes into your retronasal passage so that you can get that flavor. So this is where you kind of have to remember the difference between flavor and taste, where a taste of those five to six uh, tastes that you have, the salt, sweet, umami, et cetera, and flavor is everything else. And so this is when you're tasting those dark fruit notes is when you kind of take a short little breath in as you taste. So to everyone out there with your glass of wine, cheers. And I hope you enjoy your wine. So at this point, now that we understand a little bit about wine chemistry and how it impacts flavor, I'm going to switch back over to talking about smoke. And so we have developed a methodology in order to identify some of these smoke compounds. Now, I've already told you about some of those smoke compounds that we are already addressing, and they've been known for a while now, but what we want to address is, is there anything else? Are there better targets for us to measure uh, in order to better tell winemakers whether or not their wine has been negatively or non-negatively affected? And moreover, this will kind of help us in the future maybe start mitigating this. Once we know some of these compounds that we can start targeting, we can create better tools in order to target them. So we created a methodology in order to identify some of these unknown compounds. And this is what we're working on right now. So at the end of this talk, I won't be able to say, these are the compounds. I can say, this is what we're doing in order to address these compounds and some of the things that we have discovered so far. So at the moment, we have done some of the smoking. And so in this diagram that you see below, the methodology that we have used to uh, identify some of these compounds is we have taken something called uh, isotopically labeled CO2 or 13 CO2, which I'm going to explain what that is on the following slide. And we introduced that into our barley plant. And part of the uh, gas exchange in barley is it will naturally uptake the CO2 just like a plant normally does. Uh, and normally the, the carbon, just to note, is carbon 12. So this is different than the majority of all the carbon out there, carbon 12, this is different by one neutron and we can track that. And so when we introduce it to our barley plants, which is eventually going to become smoke, it will uptake it and assimilate it and pull it into the plant and put it into the biochemistry of the plant and represented by this little part of the chart here. Upon assimilation, it is gonna start moving it into the biochemistry of the plant and our hope is and what we're studying at the moment is whether or not it's going to some of this lignin, that it's another thing that I'm going to be talking about here shortly, uh, creating C13 lignin, which creates some of these carbon-13 labeled, for shorthand, VOCs, or volatile organic compounds. And those guaiacols, those syringols that I labeled before, are some of those VOCs I'm talking about now. 
So before I dive into that, again, I do not want to assume anybody here is a chemist. I want to show everybody what this means when I talk about carbon-12, carbon-13, why we use it, why is it important. So typically about 99% of all the carbon in the atmosphere, CO2, et cetera, uh, it's carbon-12, six protons, six neutrons. And so when we look at a periodic table, this would come out to 12 atomic mass units. Carbon-13, on the other hand, has one extra neutron that I kind of denoted by this black outlined blue sphere here. And this extra neutron gives it a little bit extra weight. And this weight, it doesn't change the chemical properties of the carbon mostly. I don't want to like completely try to pull the wool over your eyes. There's slight, very, very, very slight differences. But for the overall just of the biochemistry that's occurring, there isn't that much of a difference in terms of the chemistry between the two. Um, so we're able to use this, not harm the plants, and be able to track it later. So this is ideal for us as we're looking for compounds that are different from natural smoke and looking for our smoke is because it will have more of this carbon-13. And the benefit of using this is that the carbon-13 naturally is actually even lower abundance than the atmosphere. And that's because the way plants evolved is they didn't need to adapt towards carbon-13 because it's only about 1.1% in the atmosphere. So if it wants as much CO2 as possible, it's gonna to pull towards something a little bit easier to get, and that's the 12 CO2. And so it's actually just a little bit lower than the atmosphere. So this allows us the opportunity to create an even bigger gap. So if we get any amount of the C13 in there, it is a positive note. We can definitely track that and see that even small difference. We also have all sorts of tools that are able to look at C13 specifically, whether it is isotope ratio max spectrometry, or the specialty that I developed in uh, grad school was nuclear magnetic resonance, and even mass, spectrom mass spectrometry to some extent as well, is able to detect the differences between carbon-12 and carbon-13, especially if there is a lot of carbon-13 to carbon-12. And so again, it's this one mass difference that changes for mass spectrometry and looking at mass, it changes the overall mass of the compound, and we can see that. For nuclear magnetic resonance, we are able to see carbon-13 based on its concentration. And so if we look at something that was not treated with carbon-13 and something that was treated with carbon-13, we should definitely see a difference in the graphs by seeing a lot more of the compound with carbon-13. And then a conversation that I often have with other people that know a little bit about carbon-13 and some of these isotopes is uh, they often ask about carbon-14, and that is the, uh, the nuclear version of this that we don't necessarily even need to use because we have this other type of carbon at our disposal and it is far safer to use. And so this is actually a lot of the work that I had done in 2020. So during COVID lockdowns, I had the opportunity to go to work on a normal day and work in a greenhouse by myself. And honestly, it was kind of relaxing with the way the state of the world was at that time to just go in and grow my barley that was going to be treated with CO2. And the reason we had chosen barley was for several reasons. Uh, the first of all being rapid growth. We can finish our growth cycle in about 10 weeks. Whereas if we use something like a tree, a tree can take a very long time and it can be very, very expensive. The C13 CO2, it is not cheap at all. Some of these very small bottles can go for over $1,000 or more. And we need multiple of them to do some of these treatments. So it is a very expensive process to go through. And so something like a tree would not be something ideal for what we need. And if we remember what I said before, a lot of the, the chemistry of the plants are gonna overlap anyway. And so in this case, what we're looking at is the lignin content. And it's this lignin content that we're necessarily concerned about. And it's, lignin is the chemical that is in trees that we typically associate with bark because it is attributing the, the stiffness of the bark. It is attributing the stiffness of the barley in this case as well. And so the fact that it has all of the common chemicals in plants, such as the cellulose in plant cell walls, hemicellulose and the lignin, this makes it a good candidate, as well as low rapid glow as well as the rapid growth. Uh, we also had some local expertise uh, in a department uh, next to ours, Pat Hayes' group, he does a lot of barley work and they have been absolutely instrumental in teaching a chemist how to grow barley. And so it made the process much, much easier to perform as well. And then finally here in Oregon, especially in a greenhouse like we have at the university, we are able to grow a lot of this year round. So we can have this growth cycle occurring 
at any point in time. There are slight differences between winter and summer, but what we tend to see is, for me at least, winter is a little bit better because it gives us a lot more time. The plants tend to grow a little bit slower, but we get thicker plants and more, uh, more stalks, and that's what we really want. And so talking about this lignin, the reason I wanted to bring up this lignin is because we might be able to start recognizing some of these chemicals that I mentioned before. So this is just pulled straight off Wikipedia, and that's just because uh, the lignin structure is not uniform. Whether it is based on one plant or many, this is just a general lignin structure I wanted to show because they are very complicated interconnections between, they are polymers of these phenol groups that you can kind of see here. So we can see that phenol, this looks like one of those guaiacol rings that I had pointed out earlier. And this is just a very complicated network of these things. And this is why they're so stiff. It's a complicated network of chemical connections that are occurring. But when they degrade over time, they form these monomers. And it's these monomers that we associate with the smell of smoke, the flavor of smoke. And so there are three basic types of subchemicals in lignin, and that's the conifiral, cinepeal, and the p-cumeral alcohols. And they can form a number of chemicals. And so in fact, even in just this one slide when we're talking about smoke, smoke is not, it can't be boiled down to CO2, um, some nitrates, and a few other uh, lignin chemicals. It is over 500 chemicals that we are trying to keep track of here. And these are just the major players that are involved in a lot of what we know about smoke right now and the flavor of smoke. And so even just in the conifiral alcohol, you can have multiple types of uh, byproducts that come off of this, that under, this is not complete uh, combustion, this would be decomposition, usually low heat uh, fires, things like that will allow some of this to escape without forming CO2. This little R portion, there is no atom that is R, we just use that in chemistry to represent another chemical, whether, or another series of atoms, whether it is just a hydrogen atom or a methyl group, which is just a carbon and three protons, or an ethyl group, which is two carbons and five protons, um, and so we have just in this one, I've just listed off three different chemicals that come from that one decomposition here. It can get even more complicated when we start talking about phenols and cresols, uh, and we can even have some further deviation from that with uh, the cumeral alcohol forming syringol. And so this is a lot to keep track of for us. And what's unfortunate is not only are we having to keep track of it in smoke, but we also need to keep track of it in the wines as well, because there is that co-occurrence. Lignin is a chemical that is in plants as well. And we can often see some of these phenols increasing in um, many types of plants, including wine grapes, during very, very sunny years because plants like to use some of these common chemicals as a sort of sunscreen to protect them from sun damage. And so this just kind of expands out. I just wanted to show kind of just using those very simple chemicals that I showed earlier just a very, very small smattering of the chemicals that we know about. And we're trying to identify which of these, if they are these or more, that might be impacting the wine, whether it's through the flavor, the aroma, um, or being able to better detect it earlier for winemakers so that they know uh, what to do and make those decision-making processes about their wines. And so this slide I really wanted to add, and it's really interesting, uh, probably more so for winemakers than it would be for most people, but it's still interesting to most people because this could also affect your sensory profile for if you ever do have the opportunity to taste a uh, smoky wine, it lingers. And what this graph, this graph, this data was gathered by Jenna Fryer. Again, she's a master's student who works in our group with Dr. Elizabeth Tomasino. And she had done some sensory studies where people come in, they taste wine, and they mark how strong a flavor is over a period of time. And so many, many people do this, and they take the number of citations, and this is a proportional number here, and they look at the number of citations that they have for the four different characteristics that we're showing here, whether it is smoky and black, blue and ashy, just below that up here. We have this slightly lighter gray. Um, Third down here is this kind of mixed berry sort of flavor. And then finally you get the floral. And so what this is called is carryover, is this length of time that these flavors linger. And so the higher the citation means the more people are tasting it. So in this case, if we're looking at smoky in the black here at 20 seconds, it is by far the most taste, tasted flavorful uh, component, sensory aspect, 
to the smoky wines that they were using in this uh, trial. Second below that at 20 seconds was ashy, very strong flavors are coming out of this. So the first thing that people are probably gonna notice in a smoky wine is a lot of this smoky and ashy flavors. And then to some extent, you're gonna get some of that mixed berry and floral. But what's most concerning too, more so from the winemaking point of view is that it lingers. And this is something that I have had the opportunity to do in my own research where I have smoked some wine. And so um, some of the smoked wine that we get, it lingers for a long time. And so it can last about 100, 120 seconds or so. And so for winemakers, what we have tried to, and I don't think I have it on one of these slides, but using a, it's called a pectin rinse. Um, using a pectin rinse, you can sometimes reduce the amount of the carryover from wine to wine. So a lot of winemakers, as they're going through, tasting their wine, seeing what they have to do to process them, to make them taste as good as they want to sell, uh, they'll taste a lot of wines really, really quickly. And we want to be able to provide this data for them so that they understand that there might be a way to have a false positive for smoke and they might actually have a very good wine instead. And so what Jenna had also found is using a pectin rinse is they were able to reduce the amount of time and tasting between wines, which is really encouraging for them because they don't accidentally get a false positive for smoke and they can actually keep some of their, their good wines. And I think some of the research that they're doing right now is they're looking to reduce that carryover even shorter so that the winemakers can go about their day tasting all the wines that they have to taste. And so I'm gonna kind of switch back over to growing some of that C13 labeled barley. And I was able to spend a lot of time in that greenhouse over uh, 2020 and 2021. And so we had created these cages uh, over the course of that time to close in the barley. And so when we closed in the barley here, we eventually had to create some cages that we had to seal down and pipe C13 labeled bottles, as you can see here, and then trap the C13 in there with the plants. And we would do this for about five days. We'd come in every single day, measure the amount of CO2 that's in there, add a little bit more as necessary uh, based on the readings that we see, achieving a very high amounts uh, for what we need, but it ensured that we got a really, really high amount. And we were able to, to acquire a lot of barley over the course of, especially over COVID, when we weren't necessarily allowed back into the labs, the greenhouse was relatively open and it was just me in there. So I was able to grow an absolute ton of barley so that we could use this barley to smoke the wine grapes. And so the first trial that we had done uh, in September after the smoke events that had occurred here in Oregon, we had picked some of our wine grapes and smoked them. We smoked a ton of barley or turned a lot of barley into smoke and piped it over. As you can see in the slide here, is basically we lit it in these uh, grills that we had created with the help of our welding shop to pipe over the smoke. And we were able to achieve levels that were five to 25 times higher than we had gotten over the previous two weeks smoke, smoke events. And so we just really, really wanted to ensure that we were able to differentiate between the natural smoke that we had had a couple of weeks ago and the smoke that we had, which we are able to differentiate from using the carbon 13. So we'd taken that barley, grew it in the C13, uh, C13 environment, dried the barley out, brought it out and burned for this first uh, trial in 2020, uh, about five grams, we light it up every 30 minutes or so. And you can see the smoke meters down there and we track that and see how high it would get. Uh, and it got really, really dense. This is basically like being uh, a fire right next to the vineyard. But we're not trying to necessarily simulate a fire next to vineyards. We're just trying to see what chemicals come out of this. In 2021, we actually had the opportunity to scale this project up a little bit. And we went out to Woodhall the Third Vineyards out in Monroe. And it was an absolutely fun project to do out in the vineyards because it's very quiet. It's very peaceful. It is absolutely hectic trying to put all this project together because these cages are absolutely massive. You can see me in the middle screen uh, standing inside one of them absolutely upright um, and they are massive. They are able to encapsulate three vines. In this case, you can see the Chardonnay on the right and I believe that's the Pinot Noir on the right hand side photo. And they're about seven to seven and a half feet high, about 17 to 18 feet long, and about four and a half to five feet wide. They're really big and they're very cumbersome to move. But fortunately, our whole team was out there the whole week after um, one of the holidays in September. And we were able to do this consecutively over the course of four days, smoking different, smoking different vines, doing different experiments. And it was a fun week. 
it was a smoky week and it was a hard week, but it was very rewarding. And I, it was one of my favorite weeks that I've had here at Oregon State. And then finally, I didn't go through the winemaking process in this case, but I'm happy to walk through it if anybody has questions about it. But we did eventually make wine from that process. Um, and so once we go through the smoke process, the following week after that, we went through and picked all the grapes uh, we needed for all the projects that we had going on, including my, my grapes for the uh, smoke project. And we made wine out of them for both the Pinot Noir and the Chardonnay. And I can say that based on the, the test that I had performed during the winemaking process is I don't even have to do chemical analysis right now. And I know I have some really, really smoky wine. And so at this point, we know that we have infused the wine with a lot of smoke and we're going to be going through a lot of the chemical analysis right now. And I know we have some, some leads that we're really uh, excited to start looking at here shortly uh, that'll help start pointing us in, the, in a good direction for potentially what we can start looking at to ameliorate some of the uh, negative sensory impacts that we're talking about with smoke. And so again, what we've performed so far is kind of looking at the C13 incorporation. We've created a bit of this smoke. We've already looked at some of the data for um, how much C13 we have gotten into the barley and using something called isotope ratio mass spectrometry, basically a big long title saying we burned a bunch of our barley into a mass spectrometer, it looks at the mass of things, um, and it evaluated how much C13 we had versus C12. And if you recall, the control of that, the untreated barley is about 1.08% uh, C13 content. In our barley, it ranged from 2% to almost double up to about 5%, which is really exciting for us because when we start looking at this in terms of the nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR, as I mentioned earlier, it is going to be concentration dependent. So anything that I do now using NMR could potentially be five times more, more uh, data that we could gather. It's going to be five times more sensitive, which is really exciting. The follow-up to this is what we're going to be performing a lot of this year is we're going to be doing a lot of the separation. We're going to be working uh, with some other labs to start doing some of the separation as well. Um, looking at the HPLC, the GCMS of those volatile compounds that I mentioned before, those glycols, to keep looking at those. But we're also going to start hunting for some of those new novel chemicals. And that's where this chemical identification and quantification also comes in as well. Uh, so as we start to quant or as we start to identify some of these, we're also going to be concerned about how much is in there and what are some of these kind of sensory thresholds that we might need to be concerned about in the future as well? Because having something above the thresholds and getting it just below might be all we need for some of these chemicals that are being found in wines that are affecting the impact. And so just again, the overall aims that we're shooting for in this project is that we are looking to identify some of these novel compounds, determine the compounds that will pre predict spookiness for the winemakers so that they can make better decisions and then finally, once we go through all of that, us as chemists, as food scientists, we're going to be better equipped in order to start targeting some of the chemicals that are associating this. So this is very akin to uh, how medicine works as well. We don't just send any and all drugs at something just to treat anything. We're going to send something that is hopefully very, very targeted. And this is the, the role that the FDA has to ensure it is targeting the disease that we are shooting for. And so in our case, we kind of take that same kind of model, that same headspace, and ask ourselves the same question. If we know what the target is, can we target that chemical or series of chemicals or class of chemicals without affecting the overall composition of the wine? Because we don't want to be able to um, give winemakers suggestions that they can use, but it strip the overall quality of the wine as well. So we're kind of dancing in a very fine balance here when, we, when it comes to ameliorating the wine. And I think we have some really good ideas that uh, hopefully that we can talk about in a follow-up talk at some point, um, because once we start, once we're able to talk about some of these chemicals we find out this year, it's going to be very exciting to figure out how to treat that. And so I wanted to give a thank you at the end of this talk to uh, Dr. Elizabeth Tomasino, Dr. Mike Finner, some of the people who worked on this project, graduate student Lindsay Garcia. You guys have heard uh, Jenna's name mentioned a couple times, who has done some of the sensory uh, studies for this, and then an undergraduate researcher who's working with me now, Lena. Uh, and this was all funded by the USDA and Northwest Center for Small Fruits, and go Beavs. Thank you. Perfect. All right, Cole, thank you very much. Um, before we kind of get into uh, question and answer time, what I will say as a former organic chemist as an undergrad, um, you both 
brought on nightmares again to me, but then you also made it really cool. Like it's, it was really neat to kind of see those different components laid out in not a test environment. And I think that's why I did yeah. so well in lab and not so well in the tests. Yeah, <laughs> so, there's, there's also no quiz here. So you're good. <laughs> just drink your awesome. wine, absorb the information and you're okay. <laughs> it's just funny. Like even after 20 years, some of the things that actually stayed up here that mm -hmm. I thought I had lost. So I uh, really appreciate that. Great, great, great information. Um, for our audience, uh, those of you, some of you came in a little bit later than start and may have missed uh, the description just from Intimeter, but we definitely want you to shoot us some questions. That was a super fun presentation. Uh, kind of having the wine testing, tasting right in the middle of the science and seeing that. Uh, it's a really fascinating project. Um, I also love the pictures when you guys were kind of doing the, your farming. Uh, I, I love that stuff, the creativity and how you're, you're coming up with those apparatus uh, to be able to do that. So that's really cool. Um, those of you that are wanting to submit questions, you're going to go to minty.com, either in uh, another browser as you're watching this or on your mobile device that you can get from any of your app stores. Uh, please submit any questions that you like. We'll definitely go through those uh, for this uh, last about 25 minutes, 20 minutes that we have of our presentation tonight. Um, you can also throw them in the YouTube chat if you're logged in. Uh, but the Minty code for tonight is our event number is 51186484. And again, that's on screen, 51186484. Um, so again, Cole, thank you. Thank you so much. Around some questions. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to scroll down. I've been taking things in as they come in. Um, one thing I actually I'll, I'll do one more personal comment. You showed that one uh, representation of all those different compounds that were in there. And it was making me think like, man, class would have been so much more fun if instead of a word search, the, the, the faculty member was like, hey, compound search and like giving me a visual worksheet to like identify stuff. So I was thinking like, what a great way to get like a kid involved in uh, organic chemistry or <laughs> chemistry, yeah. create some one, worksheets for it. <laughs> that one was actually, I, I took it from my own cheat sheet that I had made the first week that I started this position because I came from, you know, from the, the bio, metallochemistry. So it's metals and proteins and, you know, beet chemicals. And I had a whole new class of compounds that I needed to kind of learn and study. And I had to sit down and just create a PowerPoint with like, these are all the chemicals that we're kind of working with. And I, I kept getting deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. And I was like, well, I got to stop somewhere because there's way too many. And so those are the ones that, you know, again, nobody needs to memorize a lot of these chemicals. It's just showing that the, the biology of this, the chemistry of this, it can get really complicated. Yeah. Oh, totally. But yeah, it's super, 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 super fascinating. I mean, to think that you've got all those components that are influencing, you know, what these, these producers and these, these vineyards are doing. It's just amazing. Um, there's a couple of people in here. First of all, comment from YouTube, your grills are excellent. Well-designed, probably a, a tinker slash welder. So nice oh, for uh, the smokers, for the smokers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll give I'll give our welder props to that one. Uh, we had talked about what we could do. He gave us a little bit of grief about the material that we were using, but he's like, you could have you could have planned this out just a little bit better. And I was like, I'm sorry, but he did kind of walk through the process, and he gave us like some really good uh, design ideas to help that out. So I'll give I'll give all the props to the the welder on that one. Awesome. Um, one thing that question that came up is you you mentioned it slightly. What was your winemaking process in your your lab environment when you took these grapes and you had mentioned that you had made uh, you guys did your own rendition of those those that, the different wines in those bottles? Like, what did you guys? Yeah, do? sure. I've actually I pulled some slides up, so I did some rearranging to kind of keep this <laughs> tight. But I can actually pull a few slides up just to kind of quickly go through those if I can yep. pull that up one more time. Uh, because, you know, the, the great thing about this project too, working in food chemistry, wine science, et cetera, is it makes for some great pictures. And I love to show off these pictures. And I think, uh, keep an eye out for a website. I think we're going to have a website here soon too. But, you know, you wake up, you wake up in the morning. Sometimes I'm not a morning person, but you wake up, you get there early and it's absolutely gorgeous out there. It is stunning to be on a hillside uh, in an Oregon morning and it is nice out and it's sunny out because it's still September. It's not, we're not quite into the gray haze of winter yet. And we're just looking at some of the grapes. And so in this case, this is myself and Dr. Osborne picking some of the grapes, pick them all by hand. There's no machine harvest here for us. This is all research grade uh, harvesting. And so when we do our uh, winemaking process, basically we do all of that in the morning because it is gonna start getting warm in the afternoon. So we like to bring in our grapes around lunchtime, eat lunch, and then we go through the process of harvesting. And so the wine, the, excuse me, the processing, uh, when we do the processing, it is slightly different based on whether it's the white wine or the red wines. And I kind of split it and I hopefully explain it here is that the, uh, all the grapes are gonna go through some amount of a crush initially. 
uh, whether it is the white or the red. The white wine that we're doing, we are not fermenting on skins. And this is fermenting on skins, as you see over here on the right, it's where you inoculate here. It's going to extract a lot of those chemicals that are in the skins. And this is actually something that I uh, neglected to mention in the talk, is that a lot of those smoke compounds, uh, for anybody who has taken that organic chemistry class like you did, you probably remember a little bit about um, hydrophobic, hydrophilic chemicals, and all those chemicals that we have been talking about look pretty hydrophobic, just like a grape skin is. And so a lot of those, a lot of those compounds will interact with each other when it comes to the skins. And so it's really during this inoculating on skin uh, portion it's where a lot of those chemicals are getting extracted out of the grape skin, whether it is the tannins and other chemicals or even the smoke in this case as well. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to mimic the most common ways to uh, make wines for the industry. And so some people in industry will do their Chardonnays on skin. Uh, we are not doing ours on skin at this time, just to kind of showcase the differences between the two and the different winemaking processes. So in this case, we skip the pressing step for the uh, red grapes and immediately put them into, these are, these are small ferments, micro ferments that we do in these uh, buckets for the first year that we were doing. And with the second year that we did this in 2021, we were able to scale up to five gallon buckets. This is by no means a large scale event. This is just research scale. Uh, if we do want to scale up again from a research scale, uh, it is slightly larger. Uh, you can kind of see in this hopper over here uh, is where we will dump the grapes in. They will de-stem them for us, dumping the stems out over here and dumping out the grapes over here. And one of our other graduate students, PhD students, Angelica, is doing the press by hand in this case. Uh, and it can get very really tedious. There were long days where September is always one of those months where we're working long hours and long days. Uh, and then finally, after inoculation for both sets of wine, they will undergo, uh, the Pinot Noir will undergo its press after it is finished uh, fermentation. All the sugar is gone. It is now considered dry. It has created as much ethanol it's going to go through. We will then go through with something called a cold settle and racking off. And that just means you're getting off the sediment, all the dead yeast and sediment that had uh, kind of fell out while it was settling. And then we can start doing, uh, not in our case, but in other people's cases, you can start doing your secondary fermentations, malolactic. You can start doing some of your stabilizations. If people are going to barrel, they can start doing that as well. Um, in my case, I had to run a lot of uh, sulfur measurements because you don't want anything growing in your wine. So they'll often add sulfite to this. And so this is just a short little video of me just being excited that I can actually work in the lab after working in the vineyard for over a month and just showing this is what we do to measure the, uh, the sulfur in the wine to make sure that we have enough to help stabilize that wine. And then finally, once we've done stabilization, I can go through and I can bottle. And this is me being very excited about a bottling for the Pinot Noir because it is, it is a process that takes month, months long sometimes and even longer for many winemakers to do this as well on a much, much, much larger scale. So this is not what you would necessarily see when you go into a winery this is a lot smaller scale because we're just doing research on this. We don't need tons and tons of this to sell. We just need enough to do the research on. And we'll pass that back to you. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now we're definitely, I'm glad I asked that because now we're getting a bunch of other questions coming in. Um, let's see here. Let me go through these real quick. All right. So uh, first one is, so uh, any health effects known to affect someone who drinks wildfire smoke wine? Like, is there any... Thing, health concerns with those that those the increased smokiness or not that, not that I'm aware of. I don't okay. know of any research that has looked at that, and that's that's mostly because the chemicals that we're looking at when it comes to wine, um, these chemicals are in very very small amounts, and that's kind of what's interesting about some of these compounds is that it doesn't take much. A little bit goes a long way, but you the the health impacts of these chemicals the ethanol would catch up to you faster than anything coming from the smoke itself. Um, so probably not. Uh, there's probably not enough to really consider. But again, at this point, we haven't really looked at it to give you a straight yes or no answer. It's just that we don't think so. It's usually in very, very, very small amounts. Yep. Okay. Interesting. Um, what about any other food-related products that were similarly affected um, that had maybe a thicker skin? excuse me, thicker skin or protective layers such as with nuts or oranges, can this lessen the impact that smoke has on them? Sure, absolutely. And this is what makes uh, wine grapes somewhat unique, not completely. And that's because a lot of other, um, a lot of other fruits, vegetables, et cetera, have kind of a coating on the outside, oranges especially, 
they can soak it up because we don't eat the rinds all that much. Like we might use it for a zest or something like that, but we don't really use it. So we don't even really look at things that have that kind of rind on them because we're not typically consuming those things. But when it comes to the, how you perceive some of the smoke in them, you tend not to get, you either tend not to get much of the smoke chemical in there or does not perceived nearly as readily as the wine grapes. And so this is why it's so important for the wine industry is because by far, they are probably the most affected industry when it comes to smoke. Um, there might be some lesser extent to um, hops is something that is starting to get more popular to look at, but uh, other fruits and vegetables tend to have a pretty solid connection on them due to either a coating that is around them or the fact that we just don't eat that part of the coating as well. That no, makes total sense. Makes total sense. Um, in 2020, was there any information like, so it's sounding like to me that it's really kind of the flavor of the wine, but I know that can adversely affect the stock of, of wines that folks are folks are producing. Do you know how many grapes that, that folks had to get rid of over that time period with that, that increase in smoke? Or was it just a matter of they're sort of creating a more smoky flavor of that particular series? No, I don't, I honestly don't know the answer to like, you know, what tonnage, if it, we were in the tonnage at that point of grapes had to be thrown out at that point. Mm -hmm. um, I know this was something like, I'll have these conversations with winemakers and it honestly, like, I, I feel absolutely awful for some of these people because they're just looking for answers. They want to know how not to go broke on some of these because some of them are very small wineries. And so they're just looking to make sure that they're making ends meet. So it's kind of tough to give them like that straight answer that we'd love to give them. Yeah. And, and, and again, this is me showing my <laughs> not being a chemist anymore. Um, yeah. We're regarding the question one more time, because I think there was one half that I'd like to answer that. I just forgot what that half was. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, just how many, how many grapes had to be trashed for 2020? Yeah. Yeah. Again, that one was, I'm not sure. Like there's that there's insurance part of this too, that I don't know if no. they're necessarily going to report it. And so it's just, again, I, I only have the anecdotal uh, information from talking to winemakers who have been impacted by this. Okay. And then, so then, so one thing I was kind of curious about as you're talking about this, like once you start to identify those factors around the smokiness of wine, like, I guess, are there ways in which chemically you can counteract that smokiness in production so you can sort of avert issues that could sure. potentially come up from the environment? Like, what's that look like? Um, so in, in my talking, so I actually have an idea with Dr. Tomasino that we're working on right now to do some of that kind of chemical amelioration. So this would be potentially kind of early fermentation, pre-fermentation. Mm -hmm. uh, I just got information that we are allowed to go forward with that project. So I'm not sure what we're going to see yet coming from it. I'm hopeful for it, but we'll have to see. But there are ideas kind of coming out there, but it's not only from the production side of it as well, but there are also ideas like in the works that we're looking to publish and Hopefully, you know, we can have a side talk on this uh, in the future as well, but we can look at it from the preventative point of view as well. So when we start talking about coatings and things like that and ways to prevent the, the smoke from actually getting on the grapes is another option that people have as well, that hopefully in the coming months, we're going to be able to share that research with everybody, um, showing that we can positively influence the wine grapes in this, this methodology as well. Hmm. Okay, awesome. Um, looks like technical question on your presentation. On the graph of the sure. taste carryover, what was the starting point to the y-axis? Uh, that was just number of citations. And so in this case, so this was Jenna's research, and I'm kind of like presenting her research. Um, and so the, the starting point of the y-axis would just be no one reported anything, but at zero hours, or zero, t equals zero, no one reports anything anyway, so everything starts at zero and then ramps up very quickly. And so it's over time, the y-axis, the number of citations decreases over time because people aren't sensing it anymore. So this is a longitudinal, or longitudinal is not the right word. Um, we're starting to show my weaknesses in the, uh, the statistics now because that's what they do heavily with this one. And so it's a study that, it's a temporal study that over time, over the course of about two, two and a half minutes, they're marking down how much they taste each of these flavors. And so what you're looking at is the number of citations, how many times that person clicked, the group of people clicked the button, it tasted smoky, it tasted ashy, it tasted, and how much ashy did it taste? There's a sliding scale 
Um, if anybody has an opportunity to do the sensory uh, trials that we have, they can do those on campus. They have signups for them. And you kind of see what some of those temporal studies look like and how they have to click and click the sliding bar and show over time, like when they have to move the bar over. And so that Y axis then would be, you know, it's the number of times someone said this, this is ashy, this is uh, smoky, et cetera. And we have a whole slew of people that do this. Um, uh, a whole bunch of people will come in, they'll all sit in a room and we have to kind of take COVID precautions for this. Um, and so typically you'll get five to six people in a room and they're all tasting simultaneously at a computer where they're following instructions and they'll get prompted as to when to rate the wine, rate the, uh, rate the attribute that they're talking about at that time, whether again, it's that smoke, ashy, floral, et cetera. No, it's fascinating. And if folks in the community have never participated in any sort of a college study as a participant, it is actually a lot of fun and really yeah. helps the researchers out. And your guys' particular case, when you have projects like this that come up that they can get involved with, what's the best way for them to, to get involved? Or how do they do that? How do they find out about it? Um, I don't know the website off the top of my head, uh, but if you, I would have to put something in the YouTube page and I'll have to follow up with it. I could definitely do that. Okay. Um, in order to sign up for that. I know we have links to that. It's just one of those I don't have memorized off the top of my head. Well, a little bit of Google, Googling around and, and looking on the university. Yeah, website, if you if you too. find Dr. Tomasino, she does a lot of these uh, sensory uh, profiles. I know the, the we have a beer crew that does some of these sensory uh, sessions as well. And so it, it happens a lot around the food, the food science departments. But if you look up Dr. Tomasino, you might be able to find it. But otherwise, I can definitely post something on um, the YouTube page so that it, we can come back to it. No, that's perfect. Not to put you on the spot with that. I just, in general, like, I think it's something that like, if you've never really, for me, it was a case of working at a college campus and realized that that was an opportunity for community members to get involved with. Sometimes yeah. people really want to, they're just like, eh, I don't know how to do this. And yeah, they're a lot uh, of fun. Yeah, they're, they, are, they really are. And they are a lot, very helpful, very helpful. Um, okay, so surface smoke versus incorporated smoke chemicals. Uh, it looks like, how can you try and separate the surface versus incorporated in your research and development? So in this one, the only way to really look at, like when we're talking about surface level smoke, I'd, I'd really have to clarify this question a little bit, but I'll try to kind of expand on what's occurring in the biology of it. Like as the smoke gets into it is, it's not necessarily smoke on the surface of the skin. It is smoke that is embedding into the skin. And so it is kind of wiggling its way into this, uh, the hydrophobic hydrophobic interactions they're associating with one another. And so it's over time, what is occurring that I wasn't able to get to in, in this short talk, but what's occurring is these volatile chemicals are becoming non-volatilized. They are becoming incorporated into the grape. Um, and I apologize if anybody can hear dogs barking in the background. Um, so what's occurring here is not necessarily the stuff that is left over on the outside it is more important about what is getting embedded into the skin of the grape and then getting incorporated into the grape. And that incorporation is also very important too, because it's one thing I didn't really touch on too much is there's something called glycosylation and glycosylation is the addition of a sugar is really all it really means. And so what we're finding is this is where we start getting into this um, idea about free compounds and bound compounds. These free compounds are these non-glycosylated, non-sugar, uh, added uh, phenols, and then we have these ones with the sugar on them. And the ones with the sugar are tending to stay in solution a lot longer. They are not volatilizing off. They're not evaporating off necessarily as fast. And so it forces them to stay in the wine a lot longer. And we can see those concentrations change over time between these free and bound compounds. And so there is somewhat of a relationship between them, but that's more so relationship when we talk about chemistry and equilibrium that would be the relationship that we're talking about uh, in terms of flavor uh, you're not going to have a lot of those uh, the free compounds there will always be some amount of free compounds and we're doing some more investigation on that too I know we are looking at actual longitudinal studies trying to get some background information on um, how much of those those free compounds are actually in grapes naturally versus what is imparted by the smoke as well. And then how much of that smoke compound is getting glycosylated and becoming bound. And then once it goes into the mouth, that's when we start getting that, that release of the flavor. And so there's still a lot more research that's going into that as well. And I think even the research that I've done with the carbon-13 could help shed a little bit more light on the biology that is occurring 
And I know, I know I've had the question a lot from other presentations, you know, is this, is the grape doing this? Is like for the glycosylation at least, is it the yeast that's doing this? And the answer is, is like, we're not entirely sure which way it's going, but it's two different types of biology. And if you add malolactic fermentation into that, now we've got three different types of biology into that. So it's really complicated. And I think the, the project that we're doing now with the carbon 13 is really going to help further our understanding of when these compounds get in there, where do they go? What do they do? And kind of where everything is coming from and where it's going. Well, that's, that's awesome. Um, kind of regarding experiments as well and looking at some of the different variables, how do you do, how did you do the, the smoking field experiment without seriously affecting other environmental variables such as temperature, humidity, photosynthesis, et cetera? So how did you kind of compensate for some of those other variables that could have come in? For the smoking part? Yep. Um, so the, the controls that we use in this case, I'll start there, are basically just any other grape that's on a vine nearby. Um, so the, the temperature in the cages is not necessarily going to be the same. And so the number of lumens or the amount of light that gets into the cage is, might be slightly different, but the, uh, the sheeting that we used on these is actually greenhouse grade sheeting. So the amount of light shouldn't change, nor should the photosynthesis in that case either. Um, so the one, the one variable that we couldn't control in this case was the temperature. And, you know, it is a basically a greenhouse that we created and the temperature did rise on some of these. But the fact that we use so much smoke in these, we're not necessarily looking at heat stress for one day for six hours. That's, that's as long as one experiment, one trial was, was six hours long for one day apiece. Uh, it was heat stress for maybe one day. It was probably no worse than one of those 114 degree days that we had over summer and August. Um, so in terms of control, we're basically just comparing something that was not put under one of these cages versus something that was put under one of these cages and smoked. Uh, so the variability between our controls and the our variable cases shouldn't be that much at all. It should predominantly be the, the major, major differences should predominantly be the smoke because of how much smoke we added. I'm not leaving any room for guesswork here. We we smoked it. It was much higher than anything that you would, you, you'd probably have to stick your head over a campfire to get that amount of smoke and do that for six hours. It was, it was a high amount of smoke. Perfect. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, moving along, looks like, um, so I think you alluded to some of the other research that you're going to be doing in the future or you're currently doing, um, specifically any plans to research further mitigation efforts for winemakers if and when smoke continues to affect the valley. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's something I'm really excited to get into. And I know other researchers, UC Davis is big on this as well. We're all, we're all looking to figure it out. And I think something that, you know, I would love to come up with this magic bullet that just comes out and says, you know, we have this one chemical that is going to treat the smoke. I don't know if that's going to occur because we just spent this, you know, 50 minutes talking about how complicated the, the topic is and how many chemicals are involved in this process. And there's there could be multiple um, multiple compounds that are impacting the overall flavors. And so there might not be a one size fits all solution. There might be a, hey, talking to winemakers, maybe you should check these levels of these chemicals. And uh, here is kind of a checklist that you will have that you might be able to go through to start mitigating some of this without affecting the overall positive qualities of your wine. And so whether that is doing some reverse osmosis or maybe a very, very gentle treatment with activated charcoal or any number of methodologies that we come up with in the future, they might have some success. Maybe it won't, it doesn't need to necessarily even take out the smoke completely. Uh, I mentioned that kind of threshold level a little bit earlier. All we need to do is get it just below that threshold and you can't sense it anymore. And so it doesn't need to be very aggressive either. And we're, you know, all the researchers that are going into this, we're all really trying to figure out our targets first so that we're not just spinning our wheels coming up with more ways to kind of uh, get people to do something that may impact the overall quality of wine. We all want to drink great wine and we, none of us, at least me particular, do not want to drink smoky wine because it, it really impacts me heavily. And so we're all looking for methods that are going to hopefully positively impact the wine industry in the future. And we all, we all do this research with that in mind, I think. 
and again, just to clarify, because I want to ask this question. So it sounds like some of the treatments that we're talking about, the ameliorations, are you talking about things to add like pre-harvest? Do you think that's more realistic or actually during the winemaking process? I think you talked about the, the activated charcoal. Yeah, it could be an option both. that would probably, it could be both. So it sounds like yeah, it could be both. solutions for both. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're coming up with, with not necessarily, again, that silver bullet, that one thing, the end all be all solution, but we can provide a battery of tools and just say like, look, Winemakers, look, grape growers, this is for everybody to kind of discuss and talk about, you know, winemakers talk to your grape growers, grape growers talk to your winemakers, get trade information back and forth and work together in trying to prevent the smoke from getting in there from the grape growing point of view. But sometimes that's not even possible. Sometimes the smoke event is after harvest. And so now it's in the winemakers point of view. And so how can they best protect themselves as well? Uh, and treat some of this wine. So it really depends. We're just going to be able to give the uh, grape growers and winemakers a battery of tools that they're able to use to help get the wine that they're looking for and put on the shelves, the best quality of wine that they can, they can make. Okay. And then, yeah, it makes me kind of think like, it's almost like you have this, this uh, prescription <laughs> service. Of, of, like I've seen like the sod companies that like, they do a soil analysis and they send you this packet or this package of things that would best amend your soil type to get the results that you're looking for. So it almost kind of sounds like we're, we're, we're on the, the verge of what are some of these chemical components that, that a farmer can utilize to get the results that they're looking for with potentially some of these inherent conditions. Yeah, so. yeah and I think, I think, I think we're going to get better and better tools too. And I know winemakers have a lot of like great tools and I've tasted some of the wines that winemakers have been able to use to kind of get some of these like borderline smoked wines. And so I know Dr. Tomasino, she'll often use this kind of like red light, yellow light, green light um, for winemakers about like, maybe this is where you should be thinking about your wines. Is it a red light? Is it so smoky you can't do anything with it? Is it maybe on the border of like a yellow light sort of? And that's where we can start doing some of these amelioration techniques uh, where we can start looking at maybe, you know, maybe we do a pre-treatment with one of these coatings we're talking about. Maybe we do, um, one of the things I'm looking at is a protein, a potential protein treatment before fermentation. Um, there's all sorts of methods and we're gonna be able to kind of give those tools to people so that they can they can do what they think is best for their wines based on the, the research that we have done. Excellent. And we still got questions coming in, but clearly we're getting close to time, everybody. Yeah. I do know before I ask this, Cole is probably more than happy to take email questions. Uh, you, you can find, uh, again, his email address at OregonState.edu. I'm just looking his name up in there. But the last question for the night, and I know we sort of started the presentation off with this, but talking about the um, differences between new smoke and old smoke, smoke maybe in the research and kind of its potential effects. And is it kind of a concentration deal or is there something about, you know, the old smoke and the lingering and whatever else that maybe has a little bit different impact? Yeah, that, that old smoke, this is mostly through Washington state, I believe through Tom Collins and he's done this research and he has found that the old smoke, it's not nearly as impactful as that, that new smoke. And that new smoke is really like, it is smoke that is very, very close to uh, very close to the winery or close enough that it is able to get there relatively quickly in a high concentration. And then over time, you know, you do get diffusion. You do get pockets where things might kind of cool down and condense as well. And so that might create different like sub um, uh, subclimates in certain areas, uh, microclimates in some areas. And so, again, this is just more of that, like, well, it's like, I don't want to say it's complicated, but, you know, it is absolutely complicated. But the old smoke, the old smoke doesn't have nearly as much impact. And in some cases, it doesn't have any impact at all, which is fortunate. And this is why some winemakers were able to get away with, um, to get away with some good wines in 2020, even here in the Valley, it was just because the smoke that they were getting was far enough away, it could be considered old smoke. And it basically diffused out enough that it wasn't high enough to affect the wines that it was in proximity to. Awesome, awesome. Well, first of all, again, I, uh, all jokes aside with my own chem classes, I love chemistry. It is an absolutely fascinating science. Um, I think anytime you can kind of add something from that area, make it fun, make it super interesting, show the complexity, but it's like also like this neat, these neat components that can come from the work that you guys are doing. I think it's tremendously fascinating, uh, tremendously inspiring, and, and definitely appreciate your work on the project. Uh, before we get going tonight, is there anything, kind of like parting words from your end or, or anything you'd like to tell the audience before we head out for tonight? 
Uh, nope. Other than cheers and have a good night. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> well, Cole, thank you so much. We'll have you hang tight a little bit after we, we close out tonight. Uh, but everybody, again, so thankful for your participation. Definitely sounds like we have some folks in the audience that maybe researchers yourself, maybe uh, you've got your own uh, mini vineyard, whatever you may be working with, uh, definitely some interest tonight. Uh, so definitely share this presentation with folks. You can definitely watch it uh, post-event uh, via this YouTube channel at OSU Cascades. And uh, before we head out, again, just want to say thanks again to everybody. The biggest thing with our faculty participation with this is that it's the time for prepping and delivering, but also just for the presentation itself. Cole has had an amazing, amazing set of contributions to OSU and the academic community and beyond. Uh, again, for our production services tonight, a special shout out to Connect Central Oregon, who have been successfully utilizing the career training and intern program to help us put these events on now for almost going on two years now uh, since we've been in COVID with these virtual events. So definitely a big shout out to Brent and, and all their helps, help in, uh, in putting this together. So this concludes our Science Pub for Monday, February 14th, 2022. Again, if you guys have any questions that weren't answered tonight, you are more than happy to email Cole. Email us at events at osucascades.edu is also another option. Again, events at osucascades.edu. Tell a friend about your experience tonight. Share this presentation link uh, when we've concluded this evening, and we'll see you again next time, Beaver Nation, out there. Thank you so much. Good night.